Welcome to Tip TV Politics inside Europe. As you can see, we are in the heart of the European Parliament today. Uh, and joining me is Stephen Wolf, MEP. Stephen, we've got in front of us, we've got a draft motion for a resolution. Just talk to us what this is about and why is it so important at the moment? OK, every uh, month before we go and vote in Strasbourg, the leaders of all the political groups in something called the Conference of Presidents meet together to discuss what they're going to vote about. Next week, one of the biggest votes they have is on Brexit and Theresa May's letter. And this document, the draft motion for resolution, is something dri drafted up by Guy Verhofstadt, the leader of the ALDE group, and as everybody knows, he's going to be the, one of the key players in the parliament talking about the negotiations. And he sets out in this what he believes the European Parliament's red lines are for these negotiations. And just to confirm this, so this will be voted on next week? Yes, they will move it from a draft motion into a motion for resolution. And what happens then? And that the European Parliament, everybody in there, you know, the 751 MP, MEPs who are there will get a chance to vote on this. There'll be block votes depending on different groups. And this will be a view of whether they want to punish Britain, as some of this has, or whether they want to be sensible and move forward in a, a, good, a good arrangement. And the contents of this motion will be used to put pressure on Michel Bernier in the negotiations for Brexit as to what the European Parliament want to see out of the negotiations. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's very clear within these, the, this document that it says that the European Parliament is going to be one of the final arbiters on the deal and that they will actually suggest that they could prevent the deal from actually happening. OK, well, let's, I should say, actually, I hope this is available online. Various news outlets have already put it up, so you can follow it uh, with us if you want. Uh, let's talk about the ECJ, the European Court of Justice, because it says some interesting stuff uh, yes. in here about there. If we look at this, I think point 17 uh, says it particularly explicitly uh, regarding uh, who's going to be the legal body which is going to be interpreting the agreement of withdrawal. Yeah, I mean, it's making it very clear here all the way through and it goes on early on in the document, that the European Court Justice is going to be the final arbiter of the negotiation. If there's any disputes between it, it goes back to them. This is not about talking about an international body or an international court that could review this. So it's the European Union drafting this resolution, the European Union's parliamentary team saying, if we don't get our own way, then that's going to be an issue. And if we have any disputes, it's going to be the European Union's bodies particularly the court, being the final arbiter. I don't think that should be the basis of a fair negotiation between both sides. It should be independent, international court that looks at this. And so just to be clear, the European Court of Justice, you don't think will be independent of the European Union. It will be very <laughs> partial towards a European uh, end of a negotiation. Well, look, the members of the European Court are not necessarily lawyers. Uh, members of the European Court have always used their powers to promote increased uh, federation of the, the European Union and they are big supporters of the overall model of, this, of a country. So I cannot see them in their history and the evidence of the past showing that they will be positive to us. There's a lot of other things, uh, very interesting, that it talks about avoiding a hard border uh, between Ireland and Northern Ireland yes. in, in this. It also talks about security not being on the table, or rather the Parliament does not want to see security on the table uh, when talking about a free trade deal. But one thing, which is point 11, talks about the budget commitments that the UK uh, should be facing. It, and I, I'll read it out here. It stresses that the United Kingdom must honour all its legal, financial and budgetary obligations, including commitments under the current... Uh, multi-annual financial framework falling uh, due up to and after the date of withdrawal. So just give us a lowdown of what this actually means. What this is actually saying is two things. First of all, we've negotiated, we're, we've decided that we're leaving and we're setting a date to go, but they're saying the European Union wants the United Kingdom to continue paying a bill to the European Union even after we've left. But the interesting thing is they're not telling us how long for, they're not giving us any indication of the amounts, and the other aspect about it is they talk about legal as well as budgetary obligations. Now, the legal part is very interesting. Are they tying into legal obligations to work with the European Union and the United Nations? Are we got other agreements that have been signed whilst which we don't know about as the country uh, that has to enter in with the European Union, maybe on uh, trade deals with other countries? So they're not saying that we're free of all our legal obligations even after we've left. And so when they argue that we're going to be putting money into the European Union even after we've left, the type of things we would be paying for, covering the cost for, what would they, just give us an example of what they would probably argue. Well, for, for example, they have a budget called Horizon 2020, which is a basically state aid to all the organisations and companies and universities and projects that the European Union thinks are good. 
but that keeps going until 2020. Our agreement to leave could occur in 19, and they will say, I'm sorry, we're going to make sure that you keep paying into that until 2020. Which I assume is something which the government is not, is going to, this is going to be a point of contention it, it, straight away in the negotiations. Well, look, it's like asking yourself that once you've been divorced from your husband or wife, that you're going to keep paying money thereafter as maintenance forever, even if you've got a partner or a new partner coming involved. And I don't think so. I think if we get new partners in free trade arrangements and we enter into a nice free trade arrangement with the EU, part of that should be to say, OK, we finished our fine obligations. We shouldn't be seeking them anymore afterwards. Just very finally, in the Offset of this draft, um, it says it, it is the duty of all remaining member states to act in unity in the defence of the European Union's interests and its integrity. Obviously a strategy that the United Kingdom could pursue is a divide and conquer rule, to go after the national interests of each state in the hope of breaking up the negotiation um, and uh, losing the unified stance of Europe in the negotiations. Do you think that's going to be possible, feasible, or do you think you, the European Union is going to stay pretty unified? Uh, unified sorry. Well, I, I'm not sh sure that they will, because at the end of the day, there are some countries who have much more trade with the United Kingdom than others. And there are others that receive a hell of a lot more money from the European Union than others. So those who are receiving more money from the European Union and have less trade with the UK might have a less than friendly attitude to us. I, I think what you see from that language is almost a kind of covert bullying. Everyone's got to stick together here. Otherwise, A, we might not get the best deal, or B, you'll be regarded as bad Europeans. And I've seen that so many times in this Parliament. And if there was one state or one nation you'd say is, is going to be particularly problematic for the EU27, it, you know, is there one in particular you can think of which might have problems? Well, I think, I think under the current government, it has to be France. And I think if Macron wins, it will also be a, v a very big problem to do so. It is actually quite possible that with a Hofstadt in charge here and in charge of Holland, that Holland actually, notwithstanding the fact that it has a really important trade deals that could happen with through the European Union with the UK, that they too could be a problem. Okay, right, we're going to have to leave that there. But thank you very much, Stephen Wolf, MEP. And Brilliant. don't forget, you can find this online and also subscribe to Tip TV Politics and on our Facebook page at Tip TV Politics as well. Goodbye.